Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 170 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck, and if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you, up to 50% off, check it out at strengthcoach.com. I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. I want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, today on the Coach's Corner with Coach Will, spoke to him about a few forum threads, including resistance for kids, front foot elevated split squats, and horizontal bounding. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. Aaron McGurr from Perform Better joins us to talk about the huge summer sale and the Hammerhead Anchor Gym. For the results, Fitness University Business of Fitness Segment, Alan Cosgrove is on to talk about annual contract and agreements. For the Hit the Gym with the Trank Coach segment, I have Brett Bartholomew, Strength and Conditioning Coach at Exos and the Director of their NFL Development Program as well as their UFC program. He's on to go deeper about the art of coaching, including his work with Wounded Warriors. Also talk to him about whether or not we're trying to do too much as Strength and Conditioning Coaches and his work with MMA. That and lots more coming up from Coach Bartholomew in a little while. For the Art of Coaching with Exos, Danielle Lafada is on to continue her three-part series on nutritional programming as it relates to the national soccer team. Part three is on recovery. For the functional movement system segment, Brett Jones is on to talk about the backlash against corrective exercise. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? You know, usually I say I'm doing great, Anthony, but I've been having computer problems for the last hour and a half, and uh, I'm a little bit aggravated. I'm hoping that will not come across in my interview today. All right, I'll try and uh, make sure my questions <laughs> are not. Uh, <laughs> um, good, so let's talk about a quick forum post about someone who was putting a circuit together for kids, and I just wanted you to elaborate on it because what he was doing was – relatively untrained from a strength perspective, but they play sports. There's a wide range, which was kind of a weird range, 10 to 17. Wanted to make it fun, incorporate some non-dumbbell, barbell objects to get their attention out. So good stuff with, with you know, he, he's on the right track. But um, you were kind of warning against circuits, and um, you said circuits with no experienced lifters are just a mess. Try for a more organized approach. The one thing that I did kind of learn from you is, remember when you were doing like your 10-station warm-up? Um, I yep. felt like it made it easier, or you you had even said it. You were you made it it made it easier to coach some of the harder movements because when um, there were some movements instead of having everybody do a single leg deadlift, for example, um, uh, some kind of a single leg deadlift uh, on a warm up or airplane or whatever, um, instead of trying to get twenty guys to get that right. You know, you had only had to work on the two because the other ones were relatively easy stations or less coachable stations. So can you just kind of elaborate on, you know, your idea, of maybe maybe define what you considered a circuit and, and elaborate from there? Yeah, well, I think those guys, even that I was trying to teach that to, were really experienced lifters. I've had really good luck with those 10 station circuit type workouts when I have good groups, when I have my BU players, when I have our Olympic girls. I've not had good luck when it's inexperienced people because with inexperienced people, usually all 10 of those things are hard. And that's why sometimes the cyclone circuit idea, I like a little bit better. You know, if you just said, okay, all right, we're just going to throw, you know, this station is going to be a throw and this station is going to be a sprint and this station is going to be a jump. But I think, I think you have to be willing to accept a significantly lower level of quality than I would be comfortable with. If you're going to do circuits with groups like that, especially you start talking 10 to 17. And the good thing was he was saying, oh, really, it would just be four non-competing exercises. And that's a lot different. You know, once we kind of narrowed it down, it sounded a lot better. And I guess as with everything that we're putting up on the site, I always want to be really specific with people so that they understand what we're trying to talk about. And I also maybe sometimes like to drill down with the questioner 
and get them to be specific in terms of, okay, this is what I really meant. Because sometimes you'll see the, as we prod and poke a little bit more, the question morphs in terms of, well, that's not really what I meant. And in, in effect, that's what this guy kind of said. Well, actually, I'm looking at kind of four exercise. It's like a quad set versus a circuit. And that's really different. You got to try to coach four things or 10 or of those 10, how many of them would you look at? Even in the old starting a high school strength program article that I wrote, I said, choose one coaching intensive exercise a day because that's going to, to really be where you've got to focus your energy for that day. If it's clean day, then it's got to be clean day and don't try to be, don't try to have clean day and front squat day on the same day because those are going to be both coaching intensive exercises and you're going to have trouble getting the amount of coaching in that you need in, in each one of those areas. So, um, again, there's so much good stuff on the forum in terms of those things that really allow us to, to teach that it's good. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, there could be a lot of different uh, interpretations of that original uh, post. But, you know, one of the things that I thought was kind of odd that no one, I don't think anyone really mentioned was he did say the, the age range from 10 to 17, uh, even in a, in a beginning, uh, I don't know if I would have that wide of a range group. I'm not sure. With the kids who are 10 and 11 and 12 to be with a 15 or 16 or 17 year old seems like a little much. What do you think about that? Yeah, I wouldn't either, but he did kind of indicate that that was sort of what he was stuck with, and I don't know what the the real particulars of the situation were, but yeah, I wouldn't, again, in an ideal world, I'd be telling them, let's look at 10 to 12 in one group and 13 to 17 in the other group, or 10 to 13 in one group and 14 to 17 in the other, something like that. But, yeah, you could always pair them up, too, with their age appropriate. Exactly, group. by age, yeah. That's what I mean, this stuff you could do. To, to try to make it work, but I think we always go back to the idea of it being logistical. How do I um, how do I create the correct logistics to make this thing happen the way that I want it to happen? Absolutely, Coach. Another kind of surprising uh, uh, thread was on the uh, front foot elevated split squats. It really got a lot of play and a lot of different answers. Uh, it was Charles Poliquin showing kind of a, almost like showing it as a regression for people who couldn't do a split squat where they would elevate their front leg. And, um, you know, a few people said they, they kind of liked it. A few people well, seemed to me more people didn't like it. One guy had said he's not going to do this. The girl in the video has none of the limitations he's describing and she's feeding so much extension into her back because of her anterior pelvic tilt. You said you're not a fan I can see that as a stretch, not an exercise, which you actually do. Uh, your kneeling, your half kneeling uh, hip stretch uh, with your with the foot ele- elevated. Um, just expand on on this exercise. Well, it was interesting. The one Dan Silver was the one who came up with, I think, the best explanation for why it might be a good thing as opposed to a bad thing, and why some people, because I think Elspeth had said she was having success with it, and Dan said he was having success with it. And in Dan's explanation, I kind of paused for a second and thought, hmm, that might work. I've never tried it because I've always thought that it would produce more stretch, not less. And Dan made a case for why it might produce less. And I know, as a, for instance, a lot of our coaches, Kevin Carr and some of those guys, really like step-back lunges from a box, which I don't like either. And probably for the same reason. So I think some of that, for me, probably is a question of I need to go and do that exercise, do both versions and then see which one I like. And then same thing with the step back lunge. Cause I think I may be falling into the same trap that I accuse everybody else of being in, which is saying I don't like something which I haven't really tried. And so I think I need to, to probably uh, make a list. That's the bad part. Sometimes I feel like I do these podcasts when I'm driving a lot, so I don't have a chance to write myself notes. Like try this, and uh, and I probably should try both of those things and see what I actually feel versus what I think I'm going to feel. Absolutely, good stuff, Coach. Um, I know you got to go soon, so let's finish up with. Uh, you're not a bounding fan. You said you track guys bound well. Most team sport athletes do not. 
Um, get, just do me a favor. First, just define what you mean by bounding so we're all on the same page. And then number two, why is why do you think that most team sport athletes don't bound well? Uh, the reason, well, bounding basically is a right to left. So if you, we can think of bounding as a very plyometric, exaggerated running action, which is effectively what it is. Whereas in skipping, we've got two foot contact. You're going to get boom, 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 boom. In bounding, it's like boom, boom, boom. You've got to be driving down hard into the ground. And the reason I say team sport athletes don't do it well is because I've tried it with team sport athletes a bunch of times, and they don't do it well. And I think that's what's interesting. I just finished listening to Boo's talk on the podcast, one of the more recent ones. And I think Boo, you know, as much as I like him and as much as I enjoy his information, he's a track coach. And one, he's probably much better at teaching bounding because of his experience with track athletes. And I think with most of us, I think, again, it's a very difficult, and although it looks simple, really complex activity, the one thing that he did say is that he uses a lot of short bounds, which I hadn't thought about in terms of maybe it's three per leg, which is going to be very different than trying to get somebody to do it, say, over a 10 or 20-yard space, which is, in general, how more people have used it. So, as usual, a guy like Boo probably comes up with a better idea of how to implement this with people. But just in general, if I gave you a bunch of team sport athletes and I said, okay, skip, and then whether what we might call power skip, he might call skipping for height or skipping for distance. But if you ask those people to power skip, you might look and think, oh, I really like that. I really like that. Then if you ask those people to bound, you'd lose a lot of that elasticity. It would look very, I always said, the difference between good plyometrics and bad plyometrics in my mind is the difference between seeing somebody dribble a basketball and seeing somebody throw bags of dirt out of a truck. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you see really good plyometrics, it's got that, like you're walking along dribbling, boom, 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 boom. And it's so nice and rhythmic and elastic. And then when you see it on the bad side, you get kind of the opposite effect where it's just this like slap, slap, slap. Like I said, like someone was throwing 10 pound bags of dirt out of the back of a truck and they just going on the ground, no elastic response, no elasticity, no response to the ground at all. And I think that's what you see with most people. I think most people are just really far away from being able to do that. Absolutely. All right. Good stuff, Coach. We'll let you go. Get back to your computer stuff, uh, your computer problems. Uh, you didn't. Uh, uh, I'm hoping was... when I look in my back seat of my car right now, it's going to be <laughs> turned on. And we... my wife is saying, "No, it's not. It's still so." Uh, I may have an even bigger problem. We'll see. Well, the podcasters did not get any of the anger that might have been directed towards the computer, so we appreciate that. That's good. <laughs> Coach, we'll talk to all you next time. All right, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better, and I am here with Aaron McGurr. Aaron, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, you know, I want to get right. I'm excited because you showed me this new this product that you guys have. So we're going right right to it. I'm um, ready. <laughs> it's the Hammerhead Anchor Gym. And first, explain what this is. Well, what it is, it's a wall mounted system that you can anchor resistance bands or anything from bands, tubing, um, suspension trainers. It's, it's great. And the reason that I think um, I mentioned it to you, especially is because I still remember a while ago you were talking about different training stations and how they cost a lot of money just to kind of anchor or abandon or, you know, keep it for a specific spot. And a lot of them are a couple hundred dollars and you're just looking for a simple piece of equipment to use a band off of or anything like that. Um, these came along and I like it because, like I said, it's strong enough where it will hold someone doing suspension training, which a lot of training stations don't. Um, and it's less than 12 inches long. So it actually will take up little space. We have a couple of them in our gym in different locations. And I think it's awesome because you can set up different stations anywhere. And a lot of times it can be in a spot where you can't fit a large piece of equipment. Um, so we use it all the time, but it does include hardware. It's got a lifetime warranty and you can pretty much mount them in any configuration. So um, they're just these steel pieces with these hooks that have a curved shape where you can lock in the bands or lock in um, really anything at different angles. And 
it's just so perfect for a small area. And like I said, if they're only, you know, less than $50 and you can put them anywhere, it made me think of you especially because you were the one saying, why can't someone come out with, you know, just a basic hook or something that's not 400 or $500. And I completely agreed with you. And then this came along and it just seemed to be the perfect solution. And yeah. everyone that's been using them has been given great feedback and they're so simple. They're good for home use. They're good for a gym. They're good for a sports performance facility. I mean, you can pretty much put them anywhere. They take up little space and they're strong. It's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, the thing about it was, like I said, with those other ones, they were big, they were bulky, anywhere from four to 500 bucks. And they're kind of one hit wonders, you know, like you're only going to use like a band on, on those systems. This one looks like you could probably put some ropes through it. Number one. Um, and then, like you said, with TRX, you got a lot of options. If you only did, you know, use two per station, um, it's pretty good. Cause you can go like kind of like a high one and a low one almost, you know, you can get your chop and lifts in, you can get a lot of different stuff in. So nice. The hammerhead anchor gym, H2 unit. Very cool. Um, e, talk to us about the, we've talked about it a lot, but you got the end of the summer sale. We got to talk about it. Give us a little yeah, rundown. Well, I'm, I, I like it, but I hate it. Um, <laughs> just because it is almost the end of the summer. And I know I say that every time, but it's true. Although I don't really get much of a summer. Um, it does remind me of winter and I don't want to think about that yet. But um we do have our biggest sale of the year, so we can save up to 40% on a lot of the products. So everything from our new Gravity Cast kettlebells, all of our super bands, our training ropes, we have ultimate sandbags. One of our biggest hits so far for the sale has been our foam plyo boxes. I know those have been coming in and going out nonstop, so um, that's always great. But we also added some bigger equipment, like I mentioned before, such as the assault air bikes, our drive sleds. Um, and then we have our first place racks and benches, which if you're going to be doing a facility or upgrading, now's the time. And I don't, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, but, um, it's not even that we need to ship it now. I know there's been a couple customers of mine that wanted to place the order and they're like, can you hold the racks for me? I'm like, of course. So, um, I mean, again, it's one of those things where if, if you know, you're going to get it now would be the time, even if you're not ready to ship it yet. Um, I would fully take advantage of this because I know these things are not going to be on sale for the rest of the year. <laughs> and it's sad, but true. All right. Well, very cool. Yeah. The summer sale, exciting times at, at, uh, at perform better since you don't have any huge summits to worry about at the moment. I'm sure you're worried <laughs> about the end of the year sale catalog. So you guys are always got to be a step ahead, but, um, E, thank you so much. Next week, let's talk about uh, some of the continuing education. you got some great continuing education coming up at the uh, Perform Better Functional Training Institute. So uh, we'll talk about that next time. But uh, anyway, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Good to hear from you. Hey, everybody. What is up? This is Alan Cosgrove, and this is the Strength Coach Podcast Business of Fitness segment brought to you by ResultsFitnessUniversity.com. Uh, this week, I want to talk about how you'd feel if you knew you had a guaranteed income of $100,000 coming into your business over the next 12 months. Right? Uh, now, that means without signing up a single other client. That means without even renewing any clients you have. That means without selling another thing, and that also means no website sales or affiliate sales or any other income, right? Sounds too good to be true. Sounds like an internet marketing thing, right? But all you have to do is start thinking about what that would feel like. Would you relax more? Would you be able to deliver a better experience for your clients? Would you write better programs? Would you sleep easier? Would you be able to take on you know, more work? Would you be able to grow your business to another level? Well, let's break it down. $100,000, when you break it down, is 33 members doing semi-private training or private training at $250 per month. So if you're charging, you know, uh, at, at Results Fitness, our model's about $250 a month on average, and that would get them uh, one to two sessions per week. So it depends on your model, but it's 33 people at $250 a month on an annual agreement, right? So if I take that further, or if you're doing one-on-one uh, and you're charging a little higher, it's maybe 17 clients 
training twice a week at around 500 a month, again, on an annual agreement. And really, when you start looking at these numbers, I mean, this is just, this is just math. This is stuff. Hey, trainers aren't good at math. They're good at 45-pound plates plus 25-pound plates, right? We can do that really fast, but we're not always good at finances. But a half a million dollars a year is 166 members on $250 per month on annual agreements. So <laughs> the key phrase in this is that we want to have all our members on some type of, a, of an annual agreement or in legal terms, a contract. Now, the idea with that is a lot, of, a lot of times a client can't pay you for six months up front. A client can't pay you for you know, a year up front. This allows them to join for a year and pay your lowest uh, monthly rate. The hardest part for that for most trainers is do you enforce that if someone defaults? That's the first question I always get. Uh, well, the answer is yeah. One of the reasons that our, the, our model, the Results Fitness University model, is sustainable long term because our members all agree to a one year commitment. Now, there's a number of reasons for this, but the biggest one is you can focus on the training. You don't have to worry if they're going to renew or not. And you can plan out your business making hiring and firing decisions, buying equipment, renewing equipment, growing your business, your marketing, because you know you have guaranteed income. And then you have a business that on paper looks really solid if you have to get a loan for an expansion or something like that. So the answer is, do you stick to these contracts uh, when you have clients uh, fill them out? The answer to that is, of course you do. If you have your clients sign agreements and you don't enforce the agreement and don't stick to them, then why bother having the agreement? Just go back to, hey, making some money this week. Uh, maybe I'll make more next week. I don't know. I don't know who will renew. I don't know if Sarah will come in. So really the, the transition for this is from this point forward, all your members have to fill out agreements. Even if people don't want to sign an annual agreement right now, like from going forward, everyone signs an, a three-month or an annual agreement. If your existing people don't want to sign an annual agreement, that's okay. But they still have to sign paperwork every single time that you get money from them. If they pay you for 10 sessions in cash, we need paperwork showing that they've paid this money for this amount of sessions. Once you've got that paperwork in place, it's quite easy to do a transition to annual contracts. So this lesson was on annual agreements and contracts. This is Alan Cosgrove, and this is the resultsfitnessuniversity.com business of fitness segment. Uh, do me a favor, check out resultsfitnesslaunchpad.com. That's our big event. It's going to come up later this year, and we'd love to see you out at that. Hello, this is uh, Brett Jones. Welcome to the Functional Movement Systems segment of the podcast. Uh, it's great to be on again, and uh, today we're just going to dive into a little bit of a, I don't know, it's a little bit of a controversial topic and uh, certainly getting a lot of uh, traction uh, from a social media standpoint and things like that. It's this uh, backlash or um, negative feelings in regards to corrective exercise, the, even just the term corrective exercise and what does that mean and, and how is it being applied uh, you know, one of the things that I teach and, and that we, we teach within functional movement systems in our level two workshop in particular is uh, corrective exercise. Um, now, we use corrective exercise within the framework of uh, we've performed a screen, we've identified a weak link or something that we think needs to be addressed, and then we're going to uh, use a a technique, an exercise, a, a something uh, could be as simple as a foam roller for a few minutes, uh, followed by a little bit of a patterning drill, followed by static stability, dynamic stability, and you know, we, we have a, a method, a progression, a, a, a way to apply these things. So we're not just uh, you know, willy-nilly uh, applying so-called corrective drills. Uh, we have a, a baseline, a system uh, an algorithm that tells us where to put our attention and then uh, some concepts that we use to direct a, a so-called corrective strategy. Um, I think corrective exercise is, is getting controversial or uh, negative feedback right now, uh, almost more on semantics than on any actual reality. 
um, one person's activation drill to help their client with a loaded squat is another person's corrective drill, uh, is another person's just warm-up exercise. And so there's uh, semantics gets heavily involved. Um, and so you know, some trainers will uh, look at their client performing a, a front squat, the knees go into valgus, and so they put a band around the knees to give them something to push out into, and um, you know, to them they're just, quote, correcting the squat. Um, to another person that's activating uh, the uh, hip um, abductors and, and it's an activation drill uh, to others, uh, it's a corrective exercise where you know we saw things go into valgus and so we're applying a, um, a, a an RNT drill is how we would refer to it within uh, within FMS uh, reactive neuromuscular training, which essentially just means feed the mistake. Uh, you see something happen, so you're going to try to trigger uh, the other uh, thing, or the 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 right quotation marks, big quotation marks, right thing. Uh, to happen, um, the the interesting thing is that nowadays, in a in a, in a very social media driven uh, world, uh, a tweet, a Facebook post, a blog uh, can begin to really change the uh, general perception because those things take on a a significance nowadays. Um, the the ability to reach uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people uh, with 140 characters or with a Facebook post and, and especially uh, paying to boost that post and, and giving it um, the appearance of having come from a, an expert. Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but social media has certainly created a, a more immediate impact to what we do uh, on a daily basis, uh, sometimes for the good, sometimes not. So, you know, corrective exercise, uh, whatever you, you want to hang that term around, uh, semantics is very powerful. Uh, we run into that with terms like stability. Uh, to some people, stability means the absence of movement. Um, when we say stability, we also kind of mean motor control. Uh, motor control more accurately, perhaps more accurately depicts the ability of a joint to maintain uh, and balance uh, its forces and maintain its alignment under load and movement um, in, a, in a different fashion, whereas stability had taken on the connotation of the absence of movement, that you were preventing all movement instead of controlling movement and maintaining um, alignment with integrity under load. Uh, as Gray would refer to it. And uh, so motor control versus stability was one of those um, semantics debates that, that kind of got touched off. And boy, when you try to change somebody's semantics and you, know, you try to say that this means that, that this means this, uh, things can get, get very interesting. But I think from a corrective exercise standpoint, um, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing corrective exercise as long as you have a why. Why are you trying to correct this thing? What told you that this drill needed to be done? Um, certainly if you're, if you're tr doing it because somebody's in pain and you're not a clinician, uh, you know, within the FMS, we, we always recommend that if, if you find pain on the FMS, um, you, know, you, need to, you need to know why that pain's there. And that usually means an appropriate medical referral uh, to make sure you're not uh, dealing with something that you shouldn't be. But from a general standpoint, uh, as I said, one person's activation drill is another person's dynamic warm-up is another person's corrective exercise. Um, so, you know, the the demonization or the uh, um, the the ability to make controversial uh, statements within a social media-driven world uh, can easily start changing people's minds on things. And um, I don't think the term corrective exercise is bad. Uh, I think corrective exercise, when you have a why, when you have a direction, when you have, um, you know, for me, it's a baseline that tells me and an algorithm that tells me where I need to put my attention. It's a, it's a concept or a, um, a path laid out 
from making sure that something has the mobility it needs to the static stability it needs to the dynamic stability it needs and then progressing into exercise. Uh, corrective exercise is supplemental. It's something, you know, if you're spending 45 minutes out of a session doing some so-called corrective drills, um, that's, that, I'm going to have some questions for you. Um, corrective exercise is similar to any supplement or supplemental thing. It is a supplement to an already well-established program. You, know, you can still have to be a great coach still have to be a great trainer um so don't be so quick to uh, feel like corrective exercise is something evil negative um controversial uh if you don't know why you're doing a corrective exercise then yeah i I have some questions for you i I think that uh we need to have a why um can a goblet squat be corrective can uh something of that can i get up be corrected sure uh show me the person Show me what you're trying to correct. Uh, show me that it corrects the thing that you were using it uh, to try to correct. Um, you know, those are all questions that need to be answered. Uh, far more important than um, kind of demonizing or you know doing controversial posts on so-called corrective exercise. Um, so semantics is always interesting, um, as I've said about three times now. Um, one person's um, activation drill is another person's dynamic warm-up is another person's corrective exercise. Uh, we just got to have a why uh, for what we're doing. And within the FMS, we set a baseline. We have an algorithm that tells us where to put our attention. Uh, and then we have a, a, a path laid out from a corrective perspective that leads us out of doing correctives and on to being a good trainer, being a good coach, uh, exercising with impeccable technique and um, you know, accomplishing a client's goals. So for more information, um, check out functionalmovement.com and look forward to speaking to you in, in another segment in the future. Hi, everyone. This is the Artist Coaching segment with Exos, formerly Athletes Performance. My name is Danielle Lafada, and I'm the Performance Nutrition Director of our Pro Elite Vertical. And we're on our third and final part in our series on nutrition as it relates to a national soccer team. In this section, we're going to briefly discuss recovery, nutrition, and supplementation strategies for the national team soccer athletes. So when we're talking recovery here, we're, we're talking fueling strategies as they specifically relate to in and around physical exertion or trainings and games. We know that recovery starts before, before training. And we want to think of recovery in three parts, pre, during, and post. We also need to understand that recovery is going to differ with the various training sessions. Is it a strength or a gym session? Is it a two-hour training session on the pinch? What is the intensity of the training session? Is it focusing more on set pieces or, you know, are we running different drills in in 5v5? We also make sure, I also make sure that the amount of depletion will determine the amount of repletion needed. Timing is of the essence here, and recovery is more than just carbohydrate or protein. It's a complete solution addressing how the athletes broke down their body. So we know we have physiologic changes during exercise, which are also going to help to facilitate our prescriptions or recommendations. We we become dehydrated. Blood sugar levels will become low, so insulin is low. When insulin is low, cortisol is high, so our immune system is depressed. Our fuel or muscle glycogen stores are low. As I said, stress hormones are elevated, and muscle is in that breakdown state. So let's start with pre-workout. What's the point? Well, we want to ensure sufficient fuel for the training session. So how much and what? Well, it's dependent upon the size of the athlete, the demands of that training session or the week's training session, and that goal. So a rule of thumb would be maybe 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrate uh, with or without 6 grams of essential amino acids or 5 to 10 grams of protein. Ideally, timing is about 5 to 15 minutes prior to the training session. But again, we, it's all dependent upon the person. We have to personalize or individualize the prescription. So if there's GI distress or any issues, maybe it's 30 to 60 minutes prior to the start of the training session. 
Some options could be whole foods, such as fruit, 100% fruit juice, maybe a half a sandwich because you get the protein and, and the carb there. We could do a shooter, uh, a carb plus a, an amino acid protein mix. You can do some creatine monohydrate. Uh, what was popular was mixing a beetroot powder with uh, UCAN starch. So that would be some strategies and some systems for doing uh, organizing your pre-workout options. So when we get into during training, so our goals during training are to do our best to maintain our fuel stores, maintain hydration status, and maintain electrolyte balance. But we all know that uh, during practices, and especially during games, that's almost impossible for the soccer athlete and most athletes to do. So that's where it becomes very important for them to make sure that they're fueling and hydrating. They're fueled and hydrated before even going into that training session. So during training, you know, ideally every 15 minutes, the, you know, the rule of thumb to get in a couple gulps of, of water or, or sports drink. Uh, we know that that doesn't happen. The whistle might not get blown for 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, and again, with fuel, uh, our components are going to be fluid, fuel, and electrolytes. Uh, we know fuel is optional. The rule of thumb is sports drinks are not needed uh, if less than 60 to 75 minutes. And then, of course, looking at our main electrolytes, you know, sodium potassium. So pulling different products that will work to to support what their what their needs are. And you know, with the unpopularity of sports drinks right now in, in, in sugar, um, we played with uh, high molecular weight carbohydrate uh, for a little while. So then we get into the post-training environment, right? We're in this catabolic state, as we kind of talked about earlier, dehydrated, blood insulin is low, so therefore cortisol is high, the immune system is down, muscle and liver glycogen stores are low, and the body is in, you know, proteolysis, muscle protein breakdown. So we want, we have that window of opportunity, and we want to get a shake or a meal within 10 to 15 minutes of, of finishing the workout. And that shake or meal is going to be based around three R's rebuild, refuel, and rehydrate. So when it comes to the fuel repletion, we look at lean body mass in kilograms, duration, and intensity of carbohydrate. Those are the three things that determine how much fuel we're going to give the athlete or the player. And then for protein or building needs, we just look at lean body mass in kilos so then, it, you know, it's, it's really important. We keep talking about these hormones, you know, in that 60, 75th minute, cortisol is beginning to rise. And when cortisol starts to rise, testosterone and insulin will drop. So making sure to get something in within 30 minutes, whether it is a shake or whether it is a meal, will really be impactful to help reverse those hormones and get cortisol to go back down to its normal level and testosterone and insulin to go back up. So when it comes to the nutritional programming with supplementation, we really want to focus on food first, supplements second. And really, we like to call compl uh, supplements complements. They really should complement your nutrition and training programming. So we want to prioritize them. We know that there's a, a laundry list of different supplements. So, of course, we're looking at the demands of the sport, the demands of the particular position, and then we prioritize what's going to be most efficient. And then we can individualize it to, to blood work, uh, more condition-specific uh, vitamins, such as vitamin D. And, again, we want to categorize them as foundational. So we have our multivitamin and our fish oil, or omega-3. We have our pre-workout, which could be the creatine with some uh, carbohydrate or uh, some amino acids. And then during, we can use uh, water and a sports drink. Post-workout. Complements would be our proteins, our, our carbohydrates, uh, maybe tart cherry juice. We were using that for a while. A lot of guys seem to be responding on that. Tart cherry juice has a very powerful antioxidant in it that can reduce delayed onset muscle soreness and provides naturally occurring melatonin that uh, is really time release. So you can drink it any time of day and it helps to um, induce a better uh, quality sleep at night. So these are all simple solutions and simple principles in order to help the players recover. And then the other element on that is just what was available to us. So with the traveling, we would have to be very strategic in how we packed all of our uh, our recovery and our 
complement lines uh, as we had to travel every couple days. So we were like the traveling circus. So making sure that we were very strategic and what I, I was very strategic in what I was bringing with me and really making sure that everything had its place and number one, to support the player and provide that extra, that extra oomph that they need to, to get through their training, training sessions and therefore perform their best at the game as well as keep things, keep things simple. So I hope you enjoyed this series on nutrition for the national team soccer player. And for more information about Exos Education, please visit us at www.teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach. And today I have no stranger to the podcast. You've heard him on the Art of Coaching with Exos segment, Strength and Conditioning Coach at Exos, Director of their NFL Development Program as well as their uh, UFC program, Brett Bartholomew. Brett, thanks for coming on today. Anthony, thanks for having me on. All right. Um, actually, it's funny. I wish we could. I think we've had a couple conversations where I wish we just could have recorded it after the segment sometimes, right? That's how this all came about. We've had some great conversations on stuff. Um, but let's, let's start out. Uh, we know you here on the podcast from the art of coaching and I wanted to go, you know, a little deeper with some stuff, just a couple questions that I had. Um, you know, the art of coaching, you know, it's kind of here we are telling people, you know, giving them uh, some some tips and cues and ideas. Um, we talk about different books. There There's some templates that we can learn from, some things that we need to do. And at the same time, it's the art of coaching, right? So how much can we, you know, <laughs> learn from the template and the books and segments like the art of coaching versus the act of being in the trenches? Because... I mean, I know coaches, and I know I would have been in the same thing had I not heard this from you guys and read some of these books, you know, who can be coaching for 10 years, still have, you know, intrinsic cues. You know, there's a lot of things that people, if they don't pursue or, you know, some kind of a higher education in this, they're not going to, they're never going to learn it. It's not just going to come from being in the trenches. Can you kind of touch on that? Yeah, without a doubt. And as you said, it's a it's got to be a happy balance it's not something you can get just from being in the trenches or from books the art of coaching is essentially just the art of communication uh we just kind of dub it the art of coaching and i think the books are really valuable from the standpoint that they bring awareness and and oftentimes when you read these things much like when you read about strength training or or the body it's not necessarily that beyond a certain point of course it's teaching you something new as much as it is reminding you of something that you already know but maybe don't do already. It's funny. I think a lot of people are always looking for, you know, what book should you read on this or who should I talk to about that when in reality, if people literally just took one of those old composition notebooks and wrote everything down, they knew about how they should communicate with others, how they'd like to be communicated with, what kind of coaching they respond to, how they believe other people respond to coaching, and they just read their own notes – They'd be really surprised at what they already know, but they'd also be really disappointed at what they may not do enough of. And so I think that's that's such a critical thing is you've got to be able to look at and say there's a lot of coaches that uh, uh, just maybe see the science aspect of it. And to your point, they've done it for years and years and years and maybe aren't doing the art of coaching well. They think they might be. They think that they, hey, I let my athletes know the expectations. They're on a sound program. Uh, but then they start going down that rabbit hole of, well, you let them know the expectations that you have for them or that they should have, but do you really know that much about them? How are they perceiving those expectations? Do you know why those expectations are even important to them? Are you on the same page with it? You know, books will remind you of things like that. They'll say, hey, you know, like Daniel Pink, and you've heard me reference a number of times, if it's personal, it's powerful or Dale Carnegie's principles on how to win friends and influence people. Just, you know, somebody's name is the sweetest sound they'll ever hear. Going through those things and you're like, man, I really don't know if I call them by name enough or if I address them by name or, you know, if when I'm communicating with them, I give them a reputation to live up to. You know, I had a guy that was late for one of my groups uh, the other week and I simply said, hey, you know, I know you're a really responsible, driven guy and you're dedicated towards leaving a legacy in the league. So I know that's unlike you to be late. What's up? 
You know, and that was just a Dale Carnegie principle. You give somebody a reputation and whether that reputation is consistently who they are or not, the bottom line is people don't like to let other people down, especially if they perceive that person as having a, a high opinion of themselves already. So if the guy is like, wow, coach, coach sees this in me and he knows that I want to be this, even if that's not 100% the truth of how that guy's been behaving, it gives him something to strive towards. And so I think there's always little tips and tools that books will remind you of. People just need to revisit those. But it's definitely a fine balance between you've got to interact with others. You've got to see what they respond to, what they don't, what personality types there are. Um, but the books are invaluable in terms of reminding you of things you may already know but don't do enough of. And, and it's funny because that just reminded me, and I think I've said this on the show with Coach Boyle many times, is it reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever read the book, The One Minute Manager. And um, it's basically when you go to, quote unquote, reprimand you know one of your employees, you're supposed to say, listen, Brett, you're such a valuable you know, commodity to the office here. This is, you know, you've, you've done some great work, but you know, what you did today, you know, we're really disappointed in, uh, you know, your performance and we really like to see you improve because again, you are such an important commodity and, but you know, person here in our family, blah, blah, blah. So what they were doing was sandwiching the bad stuff with some good stuff. So similar to what you just said was reminding them first, not coming off really negative because my next question was with you is that's a lot of people are listening right now. A lot of coaches are like, man, come on, coach. I have 40 guys and I can't be personal with everybody. How do we make it personal. If we want to be powerful, we have to, we have to make it personal. How do we make it personal with these groups? Yeah. And it's funny, you know, one of the things you alluded to there is men and women, just people in general are always best convinced at ideas that they believe are their own. So when you do communicate like that, Anthony, you know, you're basically putting in their head, like coach does understand that this is the kind of person I am. He sees this, uh, you know, when you give people this thought process of, yeah, like, He's on page with what I see of myself, my own self-image, and what I'd like others to see. He's right. I do need to be more accountable. Um, in regards to your question, how you do that is it, it takes time. It takes time of just kind of understanding the group dynamic and, and the individual. You can't go in right away and think that you're going to implement something that you've read in a book. Your conversation has to be authentic, and <laughs> sometimes that's just letting it slow cook, you know. These guys want to be talked to. They don't want to be talked at. And they want to, they want to feel like they're educated. They don't want to feel like uh, you know, somebody's trying to speak over them. So I think just bringing an air of authenticity into it and feeling around and, and just being observant. You know, I talk a lot. That's, you know, they always say, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth. I'm in full agreement. But he gave me a pretty loud mouth. And I'd like to think, well, he wanted me to say a few things as well. And so... Even though I talk a lot, that is simply the majority of what's coming out of my mouth is either questions or pinging things in a sonar type uh, fashion to see how the athlete reacts to the information or dialogue I'm giving to him. And that always facilitates the next move. Much like this podcast, you'll base certain questions off of answers that I give. And so when you start with a guy of, hey, what brought you here? Um, what were some, uh, what was one of the best coaches you've ever had? Why was he one of the best coaches? I think that's an invaluable question. I always ask a guy once I get to know him, what's one of the best coaches you've had regardless of level or sport? And they'll give me an answer. And I'll be like, all right, why, why do you feel like he was such a great coach for you? And they'll give such dynamic answers. They'll say, well, you know, he harped on me. He, he never let go of the details or he never let me slide with anything or he educated me. You get these variable dynamic answers that, immediately that athlete doesn't think I'm taking notes, but I've just jotted that in my notebook, my mental notebook, so to speak as, okay, he's responded well to a coach like this in the past. This is how I'm communicating with this guy. And then I have a spreadsheet that I'll put together um, with some of the groups I coach long-term where I'll do this, just like somebody may have all their athletes and then you know they go across the line and we'll put their vertical jump number, their 5-10-5, what have you. I'll put what kind of yeah, uh, coaching he responds to, what his personality type is, what motivates him. So I'll create a five to 10 piece kind of a personality assessment on the guy. And then you can use Excel to just group them by uh, like-minded characteristics and things like that. And it really doesn't take long. Shoot, 
half the people can just add that as a tab to their Excel. So it's got to start from authenticity. You've got to use kind of a verbal and a dialogue based sonar, so to speak, so that you can see uh, what pings and what doesn't. And you've got to be taking these mental notes all the time. But then most importantly, you've got to be doing those things within the dialogue itself. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and I think, again, my, my, the reason why I ask it is I'm trying to anticipate some of the questions that I see on like the shrinkcoach.com forum where, and it's, it's not so much a question. I think it's, it's always an excuse. Well, you know, coach, I have so many guys or whatever. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, what you're saying is it, it is a long-term approach. You know, you can't, it's not going to happen overnight and you got to do what you can. You, you know, like you said, if you write some of this stuff down, uh, you're going to, you're going to start to build on it and, and you're going to start to see some, like, I think I was, I heard on one of the podcasts where you're talking about kind of reading a room, which can be really hard to do. Give us some examples of, uh, when you're first going into uh, a new group, what are some things you're looking for to kind of help you with that? Yeah, so great point. Yeah, what I had said is, you know, it's not a, it's not about being the smartest guy in the room as much as it is about being able to read the room. And when you read the room, just by watching their behavior, you can kind of see uh, what the dynamic is. So let's put this in the context of when I was in the collegiate setting. You know, transitions happen all the time. And I was there when Nebraska had transitioned from uh, a new coach to the Bo Pelini era. And I didn't get to be there for the direct onset of when James Dobson came in, but I was there for part of it, at least six months of that transition. Now, one thing that I felt like he did is, you know, it's not about going in there right away and capturing numbers on the guys and all the assessments. You know, that's definitely a piece of it, but timing is everything. The first thing you've got to do is change that culture. So going in there and instead of having the mentality of, you know what, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to turn everybody into a bunch of animals. We're going to get hyped. The energy has got to be high. You've got to go in there and say, hey, what's What's the dynamic of the team? What did they struggle with last year? What's the makeup of the players, even in terms of you know, where the majority of them come from? If, if you have a bunch of players from rough areas and you don't even try to relate to that and maybe tell them stories of your personal struggles or your mistakes, you know, you're not going to have players that respond to you. And people can do this in the team setting just like we can do it in the private sector. You know, it's not like you get up and you give them a Gettysburg address. What you do is once the session started, as you're making your way up and down the racks, you take time just to communicate with the guys. Then you say, how'd that set feel? You know, have you squatted much? You know, do you like squatting? Have you done this much in the past? And then boom, all of a sudden take that into a side conversation of saying, you know, what was some, uh, what was a great coach you had in the past? Or what was your old coach like? Or what did you respond? Like these aren't sessions that people have to sit down and act like they're Oprah Winfrey from. It's just small little darts that you're throwing periodically. And as you walk away, you make a, again, a mental uh, check mark of what's going on there. And so, you know, I think just being able to read their body language, when we had an NFL group, this, we had 30 guys training this off season and the guys just really uh, wanted to work. And so they didn't really want much verbal kind of uh, dialogue as much as they wanted a, a strong message for the day. I saw that they responded to that. They want to know what we're doing, how it should be done and then get to it. And those are groups that you may not need a lot of descriptive type fluff. These were veteran guys that had been educated. But if you're going to a team where it's a lot of freshmen, you know, or a lot of underclassmen, uh, uh, you know, in, in respect to maybe you just had a huge senior class leave, you know that your dialogue with them has to be a little bit more educational. Because if you want them to buy into that program and show the enthusiasm and engagement, you're going to have to let them know that they're a part of something, not just a piece of something. And so I think those are dynamics, again, Anthony, like looking at where they come from, what's the makeup in terms of the age range, get an idea of what coaching styles they relate to, and then remembering you know, to sit back and observe more than just their weight room technique because their hang clean ain't going to tell you much about them as a person. That'll tell you about them as a lifter, but you've got to sit back and see how, how they respond to it. So um, I think just observing and continually trying new messages and flinging that out just like you know, a lot of the pioneers of this industry did with the exercises and protocols. You have to see what works and what doesn't for your group. But three, to bring that down to three simple sentences, they need to feel informed, not spoken to. They need to feel engaged, but not overwhelmed. And they need to feel inspired, but not inflated or bullshitted. All your messages have to be authentic and, and they'll know if you're paying attention or not. It's funny because I think you just answered my next question about 
you know, we talk about trying to trying to let them understand what uh, what's happening, what what we're about to do, and how it affects them. And I think it's funny because I I had asked another trainer a question for you know, on nutrition, because it's not my strong point it, for my client. My client was there and I said, I asked him, I said, Hey, you know, can you tell us about this? And the answer that he gave in my call, we, I went golfing with my client the next day. And he said, man, remember when you asked him that question, boy, that was some answer. I didn't really understand what he was talking about. So I, my question was, how do you really, it, it you know, understand how do you formulate those type of things to make sure that these guys are understanding what you're saying or how it's going to benefit them? Could you just give us some examples? Because sometimes that could be really hard. We want to, you know, we're like, well, your anaerobic system and you, know, you don't want to get too <laughs> technical, but at the same time, you want to let them know how it affects them. Talk to us a little bit about that. For sure. And you alluded to it. We love our words in this profession in terms of, you know, it's, it's just the way our brains work. We love our words and we love complexity because we like figuring out the puzzles. The bottom line is you've got to have a mantra for yourself. And all you're trying to do when you talk to these guys is give them the no for the now. You're not trying to sit up in front of a, you know, imaginary science-based committee where, you know, somebody's asking you, now, Anthony, you know, I noticed that you decided to do 10 second intervals with 50 seconds rest today on the Versa Climber. Tell us exactly what energy system is working there and how that's working. You know, these guys, these guys simply want to know, coach, what are we doing? How does this help me with my sport? And then go. So when we're working with, uh, for example, when I'm working with my fighters, you know, I'll say, hey, guys, in the octagon, you're not getting a lot of this uh, shorter burst, foster creatine based system. All you need to know about that is this helps your ability to produce high intensity uh, or high intensity repeated bursts uh, of, of power. Right. So this isn't the thing that necessarily is going to make you last the duration of the fight as much as it is that when that fight gets hairy, that you're going to have some kind of reserve in your system that's going to allow you to deliver, uh, you know, a violent flurry when the opportunity presents itself. Right. Or you just say, hey, guys, like when you are running back, we trained LaShawn McCoy this year and LaShawn, like trying to get his attention, his attention span was minuscule. Awesome guy but minuscule. And obviously he's had great coaches such as Buddy Morris and everybody else. So I'm sure I didn't do anything that, um, you know, they haven't already done when they set the foundation, but I related the opportunity, the opportunity when we were working on either power or short, intense, high intensity ESD to when he sees a hole open in the offensive line or a gap. Hey man, this is your opportunity. And when you see that open up, how do you hit it? And he's like, hard as hell. Exactly. So when you're doing this squat rep or when you're doing this interval, I need you to burst through that as fast as you can, just like you saw an opening in the line. And so you just got to kind of create that Bob Ross-esque, you know, verbal imagery as opposed to giving them a bunch of complexity with the words. And, and that's what I always say by there's too many painters and not enough artists. There's a lot of people that know the colors that we can use in strength and conditioning, so to speak. Not so many that know how to blend them together perfectly to make an image come into view uh, for the person that's ultimately going to be enjoying that painting or viewing it. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, coach, let's talk a little bit. I know you work with, uh, some of the wounded warriors and you have in the past and you guys, you still do now. Um, and I want, because I feel like this, the wounded warriors, sometimes not all of them, but there it can, we can relate it to some of the kids that are coming into the, into the gym, because, you know, how do you approach this when you're dealing with maybe a little bit more delicate psyche, you know, somebody's coming back from war, they might be, uh, have lost a limb. Um, and it's, it's I'm, sh I'm sure it's depressing. I'm sure it's, uh, it's a, a big blow to your self-esteem. Um, I'm sure there's times when you don't want to do anything. Um, so depending on where they are in their rehab, obviously they can have more of a delicate psyche. And I feel like there's probably a lot of coaches out there that feel the same way with some kids that they're working with who come in and maybe have, you know, broken homes or, you know, maybe get bullied, et cetera, et cetera. Talk to us some of the lessons you've learned, uh, for you know, the art of coaching with the wounded warrior. Yeah. First of all, and, and anybody that's listening, that's worked with military in any capacity understands this tremendous honor above all else to be able to work with those guys. It's, it's an amazing population to work with both, both to get the, the unique perspective of what they've had to go through just so we can do this job. 
and what they continually have to battle with in terms of, like you said, Anthony, the, the psyche and the challenges and everything. And, you know, for everything they do for us, it's just, it's always great to be able to give back to them. The art of coaching with those guys, and we just had a group of 24 um, come in. And again, some of those are in wheelchairs. Almost every single one of them had knee braces on. Uh, we've had a gentleman come in and literally uh, have a seizure in, in the middle of a training session where, you know, just health issues that he had had in the past caught up to him. So we have such a not only psychologically fragile group, but physiologically as well, just just worn down and beaten and, and things like that. And that's that's why we call them warriors. But the thing is, is we try to we try to seek to understand first and make them feel welcome. And one of the first things, because I always have to give them the tour. Um, one of the first things we say is, you know, this place isn't just for athletes. You guys belong here. You guys are athletes. Every human is an athlete. This place is about movement and helping you understand what you can do. So an example of the art of coaching there is you put yourself in their mindset. They come in, you know, they're dealing with pain. You know, some of them are dealing with substance abuse and addiction and, and fragility. And so what I say is guys, I know this, this is a new, this is a very overwhelming place. Um, some of you may think, what am I doing here? Trust me, you belong here. This isn't about exercise or movement. This is, uh, as much as it is you guys understanding what you are capable of and how you can get some tools to manage your life and your pain. So you have power over what goes on with your health and your body. And immediately you've kind of given them what I call an emotional payment, right? You've shown some kind of social fluency through giving that payment of saying, I understand your concerns. I understand where you're at. I may not fully understand it because I don't feel it, but maybe a better word, Anthony, is I appreciate it. I appreciate where you're at. And trust me, we're going to give you tools. So please don't be overwhelmed and think that just because you see jerseys on the wall and NFL players or major league baseball players walking by that you don't belong here. You belong here more than anybody else because you guys are an example of what we're trying to achieve through helping people move better. And so, you know, they come in and we give them an icebreaker kind of presentation where again, just to kind of get them relaxed, we do something called own it and we'll show them kind of a, a PowerPoint presentation. Cause these are, these are formal groups that will come in for like a week of training and We'll, we'll put images up such as, you know, Joe Dirt and Joe Dirt. And so we'll say, all right, who had a mullet in the past? You know, some guys will stand up. Oh, yeah, yeah, I had a mullet. All right. Who uh, who likes chick flicks? Oh, yeah. Some of us, some of them will raise their hand. It gives them. And then we'll be like, who's in the Army, Navy, Marines? And so we start getting them engaged from the onset of rebuilding that identity, either through jokes or through affiliation of saying, hey, all right, we know who you are. We know what you've come from. Guys, let's keep this lighthearted, but let's also educate you. And then everything we say to them from that point on, Anthony, is yes, you can. We had a guy come in that was in a wheelchair, and we were trying to do an FMS on him because we try to give them, you know, corrective solutions that they can do to at least manage the issues that they have. Um, I'm not sitting here saying that these guys leave with correctives and then their lives are glorious, but, you know, getting some of them to do some soft tissue or simple stretching and mobility absolutely helps with a lot of their pain. But anyway, day one, he's like, son, I can't even get out of my wheelchair. There's no way in heck I'm getting down on the ground and doing anything on my hands and knees. So, you know, what we do is we get them on their back or we choose a different assessment or, you know, we simply assess what we can and we say, hey, man, there's always a way around this. Now, look at you. You didn't think you could leave that wheelchair, but now we've given you four solutions that you can do. And then the day after that, that guy will get out of that wheelchair Um because some of them will use the wheelchair a little bit more than they need to. Sure, there are some that are permanently handicapped, and that's a different story, but we can still show them upper body exercises they can do with a Kaiser row or you know a lat pull down, which is even more important when you get these coaches, and I think you get young coaches that come out and say, oh, this exercise sucks, this exercise sucks. Well, have you ever worked with anybody in a wheelchair? Have you ever worked with somebody that hasn't literally moved in five years? A lat pull down doesn't really suck, you know, when a guy, when a guy hasn't done anything in five years. So <laughs> yeah. you look at, you look at exercise and movement as empowerment. So you've got to, you've got to just kind of give them these emotional payments, but then also social fluency from the standpoint of, you've got to show them that you understand their world, but you're still wanting to make their world better and, and you can help them do that. Yeah, that, that is incredible. And, uh, I think it's funny not to compare, you know, people come in in pain all the time, like at the yeah. average client, and, 
you know, nobody realizes like until, you know, you, when you see somebody else in a wheelchair, you're like, oh man, thank, thank God I'm not like that. You know, I don't, I don't have to deal with that. I'm really lucky, you know, but, but other days I'm like, oh, what was me? You know? So I think everybody kind of comes in with these ideas. My shoulder hurts, my knee hurts, my, I, you know, I can't run or this, that, you know, but I think if you, if you took that same approach with people, um, you know, and again, like the high school athlete or any athlete, any average client, it, it's definitely a good strategy. It goes going back to similar to what you said before, just about, I think we already know a lot of these things and we have to just sit down and focus and apply them. Great stuff. Right. That's, it's, it's, it's finding more creative ways to implement simpler things, you yeah. know, with populations like that for mm-hmm. sure. It's awesome. Um, Cool. Let's move on to just some other stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll get you on a rant here. Um, you know, recently we had Pat Ward on, uh, Devin McConnell. They were talking about monitoring, and um, you know, Patrick is the sports science analyst at the Seahawks. Devin's at UMass Lowell, and he, they're doing amazing jobs. They have great approaches. They're both great coaches, um, and they're, they've really taken a simplistic view to some of this monitoring. But my question to you is because you know you're working with again MMA, NFL, wounded warriors so many different populations are we worrying about too much right now are we complicating things i think it depends on your situation you know and i think i think both of those guys would tell you too i and i haven't had the pleasure of you know meeting them personally but you know all they say is data just helps you make more informed decisions so i think i think some people certainly could be out there you toying around with stuff that they maybe don't understand fully or don't you know have the staff to implement the data that they then capture, right? Because that's only a piece of it. And these are, you know, these are certainly people unlike the two that you just mentioned. If you have a staff and you know how you're implementing these things and you have the ability and full support to implement these things and you have the environment where you can implement these things, all for it. That's awesome. But there are some people that probably don't need to be worrying about that as much as, as they are. You know, I think there's a lot of coaches that will listen to this and feel like, my God, I'm behind the times. I need to get with this. I need to start reading data analytic books. They start toying with things. And again, they may not do some of the basics. They may lose sight of the basics then trying to chase this stuff. So I certainly don't think it's a fad. But for sure, whenever something like this comes into view, the, the difficulty is in how do I balance it with what I'm already doing it doing? And then how do I implement it in a meaningful way? Like my schedule changes. My coaching schedule changes almost every week. I don't have a situation where, you know, just because I'm in the private sector, I have people that always come back to me, you know, year in and year out, and I have years worth of data on them. I, I coach a different guy this week, then I'll coach next week in some respects, and then the week after that, people can stay any length of time. So for me, you know, monitoring doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense uh, in, in that formal regard. You know, I have to do what I can in some aspects with, with questionnaires and, and just looking at their performance and look at their progression with the loads on their uh, training sessions. And, you know, if I, if I was in a team setting where I had a lot of these, uh, again, staff-wide support, or if I had athletes that were here and said, hey, Brett, I'm going to be training with you for a year straight. Or I'm going to be training with you with several months in a row. You know, these are arbitrary time periods uh, to a degree. But then, yes, uh, you know, I'd start to see what I could do within the budget that we have here to do those things. But I think I think people just need to stick, by and large, with some fundamental stuff and really assess whether they're doing that well enough or not. It's kind of like when people would talk about, and I said this on another podcast, Anthony. You know, you go to a seminar and some guy starts talking about super maximal eccentrics and their effectiveness and in, in attenuating the neuromuscular system, and you, know, who the hell are you training? You know, and so if you if your missing link right now is monitoring you're in a really blessed situation if you feel like that's the smallest thing that needs to get you over the hump. Uh, Conversely, if you have the access and the ability to get these tools and you're not using them just because you're stubborn and and think they're a fad, you're doing yourself a disservice. At least educate yourself on it, uh, talk to others that are more educated on it, and see if it's appropriate. And if it's in your scope, by all means, use it. So Yes, there's always we always overcomplicate some stuff here. You just got to take it as an individual kind of do I need this now rather than being like, oh, everybody else is doing it, so I really need to jump on it. Yeah, good stuff. I guess, you know, there's that whole uh you know, FOMO, fear of missing out, right? I think, you know, because of this media proliferation, this, you know, social media and everybody's doing all such great things. And and so I think 
uh, you know, we have to we have to be careful with that. And, and you know, again, Devin and Pat both warned against that anyway. But um, yeah. and the reason part of the reason why I did want to ask you about that was because I mean you're working with MMA fighters. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because you I mean, these guys traditionally have uh, just beat themselves up in the gym because they have so many different uh, styles or disciplines of the martial arts that they need to make sure that they're well versed in, and then they have to have a strength and conditioning program. Um, so I wanted you to talk, and you uh, episode one sixty seven. If some anybody doesn't know, Brett was on, talked about some of uh, all of this stuff with in relation to the MMA fighter. But I want you to expand on this a little bit in terms of, you know, Coach Boyle talks about different buckets like a strength bucket, a power bucket, an endurance bucket, et cetera, et cetera. What buckets do you feel like uh, the MMA fighter uh, really, you know, it's low. Um, Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. Yeah, and Anthony, you hit the nail on the head. Ironically, if there is ever a sport that would value from monitoring, it's those guys because you want to talk about stressors. You know, the norm in the past or what people used to say in the past about you know, how, how grueling football two-a-days were. Imagine being a mixed martial artist that can go from anywhere from two to five different sessions a day, whether that's fighting or training or conditioning or what have you. And then imagine if, if any of you, and there's a lot of listeners, I'm sure, that have either done MMA or Muay Thai or, or boxing. If you want any pure indicator of the amount of stress that you feel and how quickly your internal environment can change – everybody knows that like you can hit a heavy bag, you can hit mitts and you can feel really good about yourself. You can, you can take that at a certain pace and work fundamentals. But the minute you spar, and I remember this from, you know, when I, and I still box, I still spar on the weekends at a local place out here. The minute you start sparring that heart rate response and the psychological response and the amount of, you know, just internal stressors, you know, compared to just more, again, uh, controlled environment work, such as mitts and pads, is absolutely incredibly uh, more potent. And so those guys, you know, have so much stress that they've got to encounter along with military. Um, so in terms of the bucket that you have to fill with those guys, what, what necessities, and this is kind of where you've got to think like a detective, what, when somebody encounters a lot of stress, what do you usually need to harp on? Well, let's talk non-training related first. First, you know that they need to get some sleep. They're going to need sleep and nutrition, and those two things become even more important Um, From the standpoint of when they're learning new techniques and skills, sleep uh, helps rein those things in and helps commit them to long-term memory, right? In addition to all the uh, regrowth, repair, and regeneration that takes place during sleep. Nutrition, talk about controlling inflammation, right? Talk about wound healing. And you look at some of the supplements that are out there for these guys or at least marketed, it's all towards, hey, mental acuity and freshness and this and that and, and react. And so then you get a lot of energy drinks involved with this. These guys need to be uh, eating intelligently, taking fish oil, you know, leafy greens, blueberries. And again, you got to find a creative way to, that we, we had a bunch of fighters. One of them hated fruit and vegetables. I go, listen, man, you got to understand that this isn't about what your palate really likes. It's about when you get cut over your eye during sparring or anything like that, if you don't give the body the nutrients it needs to heal that, that that's going to open up during a fight. So you need to look at this as medication uh, and, and medicine and fuel as much as anything else. And you've kind of got to get past, you know, the bougie way of, well, I don't like this. Find something you do like and understand the purpose. And so regeneration and nutrition is huge for all those reasons and more uh, to manage that internal and external stress and recovery. Training wise, it's the simple things. People are probably going to gasp in a few months when they open UFC magazine. I recently was fortunate enough to write a piece in there in terms of what their training should be like. And the author was like, can you pay special attention to the core? You know, I think our readers really, you know, how important the core is to, and he just kept saying that word. And I was like, here's your program. And I sent it to him and, you know, it was, it was what they requested. It had to be a three day program, but it was filled with uh, Olympic variations, plyometric variations, front squats, RDLs, deadlifts. And, you know, he had responded back and he was like, this is great, but how does this work? <laughs> how does this work? the core and what is the purpose of this? And I said, listen, man, <laughs> good program design for any athlete needs to be ground-based, multi-planar, and multi-joint. And whenever you do those exercises, the core is going to work in the way that it's most naturally intended to and reflexively the way it does in a fight when it contracts to brace or transmit force. And he was like, wow, like 
he had just been so used to, you know, all these fluff written programs out there. It's such a, it's such a crazy, um, in the mainstream media and, and general public size, it's such a crazy deviation when they see a program that's maybe got four exercises, all compound movements. And sure, uh, so to answer your question succinctly, they need more base strength. They need better movement quality. These guys move so well in the octagon, but good Lord, when you get them doing just general kind of motor skills, whether it's skipping, marching, crawling, and uh, like I'm not getting crazy with this stuff. It's just general coordinative type activities that they're going to need. They're so discombobulated. And so if you're a motor skill junkie and you're a, you know, a baseline strength junkie in terms of just you know, getting guys strong in the foundation, you will find no better population work with than UFC fighters because, man, they need that and they need the energy system development that they don't get primarily in the octagon, which, again, is going to be a little bit more aerobic. Yes, they get a lot of aerobic in the octagon as well, but uh, that and the phosphor creatine system because they're primarily yeah, anaerobic when they're doing those bursts. But simple stuff, man. Like I said, find, find more creative ways to do simple things and, and be smart. Their shoulders are banged up. So you know, it's probably not a great idea to do a ton of uh, let's do snatches and then let's follow that up with overhead lunges and then let's follow that up with high rep pull-ups. Like use common sense, uh, much like rugby when these guys are banged up. You may have to do some, some just simple Olympic pulls. You may have to do some kettlebell swings. I know <gasps> that's always like, well, those don't deliver the force development. Yeah, but they still help with the contraction and relaxation, uh, relaxation element that you see with punching. So um, they need to do RDLs. They need to do this basic stuff because their mobility, baseline strength, and movement coordination generally sucks unless that's a multi-sport athlete, which we've noticed any of those guys that come out that were multi-sport athletes before finding MMA um, are great at. But people that typically got into judo or, or stuff like that really young and didn't do anything else um, typically are not always as well-rounded there. Yeah. Let's finish up with um... – the interval trap. Can you just expand? Because on the podcast, you did say, you know, don't fall into the interval trap and how it relates to the uh, MMA. We'll finish up with that. Yeah. The only reason I can say that stuff is because that's a big mistake I've made with my own personal uh, training in, in the past, meaning my own stuff. You know, when I was younger, I, I used to love running a lot. I'd run a lot of just long distance. I don't know. I've always been like a power endurance guy, despite being, you know, a whopping 5'8. Um, but then once I had heard about interval training when I was a teenager, that kind of fit my mental intensity. So every day was hill sprints or prowler suicides or shuttles or, you know, just something hardcore. And I loved pushing myself and just feeling that exertion. But then you get to this point where people talk about uh, people that are interval junkies kind of walk around just because of that huge adrenal stress and just huge stress in general, kind of they walk around like zombies the majority of the time because every day they have to mentally and physically just get up to that high intensity range. And then what I found is anytime I did that, especially with my own fighting, and I neglected the aerobic piece, I almost felt like I was more out of shape, and I couldn't figure out why. And I had read all the research that, hey, you're still in the aerobic zone when you're recovering, but that's not still quite the same thing. Yes, you are, but you're still getting ready to do another bout, so that, that kind of uh, interval piece still isn't going to replicate the true benefits of longer, steady-state uh, cardio. And so... You know, just always using that analogy of your, your aerobic system is like your salary. It funds all of your other kinds of spending. Your anaerobic system is like cash in your wallet. You can spend it now, but you're going to have an limited, you're going to have a limited supply over the long term. And then your foster creatine system is like the credit card. You can swipe back and enter that in the uh, internet, you know, quicker than any other form of payment, but you keep swiping it. You're going to go into debt real quick. So long story short, just to make sure that these athletes are getting the constant supply needed for those high, uh, higher intensity intervals and so that their body is recovering, getting the uh, nutrient delivery, angiogenesis, you've got to be able to have them slow down and understand the value of longer steady state um, type uh, cardiovascular work to really have a well-balanced system. Because otherwise, everything they do is in, a, in intensity that what, what adaptation are you even getting anymore if all you do is anaerobic and and, and foster creatine. So just slowing it down, allowing them to mentally kind of slow down as well. Um, I think that's critical. And my mistakes in the past in myself and, and previous athletes I've trained, I think, uh, validate that. And I'm sure some other people can relate to that as well. 
Yeah, yeah, great stuff. And again, the importance of uh, doing some of this stuff on your own too sometimes. So, um, yeah. Brad, thanks so much. We always enjoy uh, all of your segments on the Art of Coaching with XOs. And now getting you on for the Hit the Gym with the Trend Coach segment has been really great. Like I said, uh, sometimes I feel like I should have recorded a few of our, our uh, off-air conversations. So <laughs> great stuff as always. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks again. I'm always honored to be able to talk to you guys and hopefully um, – influence some of the decisions other coaches make in a positive way. And as always, if anybody's around the Phoenix area, please come talk shop and and hang out. Uh, Always love learning from you guys and everybody else out there as well. All right, that's going to do for episode 170 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Parr, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Brett Bartholomew for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement. Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at ResultsFitnessUniversity.com. Brett Jones and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at FunctionalMovement.com. Danielle Lafada for her insights into the art of coaching with Exos. Check them out at TeamExos.com forward slash hashtag education. Don't forget, Audible.com is giving Strength Coach Podcast listeners a special offer to download your free audiobook today. Go to freebookfromant.com. Again, that's freebookfromant.com for your free audiobook. And of course, remember, you can join strengthcoach.com and have access to the site for just $1, three days, just a buck. Once your three-day trial is over and you become a member, you'll be able to download Coach Boyle's two books, Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities, as well as Advances in Functional Training. And remember, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. To access those offers, go to strengthcoach.com, click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name is Anthony Renna, and you can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.